This podcast is proudly brought to you by www.maximusmark.com and Enterprise Fitness. For more great podcasts just like this one, visit www.maximusmark.com forward slash radio or, or search Maximus Mark on iTunes. Hey, hey, folks, it's Maximus Mark, and welcome to the show that punches you in the face with information, but in a good way. And today, I have a very, very unique show for you with one of my all-time greatest mentors, Dr. John D. Martini. John D. Martini is a renowned author and speaker. He's literally touched millions of people across the globe with his work. And I mean, if you've never heard of Dr. John D. Martini, he's, he's on the same level of someone like Tony Robbins or Anthony Robbins or Robert Kiyosaki. He's in this kind of, same kind of field. He is considered one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior and personal development. Well, today we have the absolute pleasure of speaking to John about health and the mind. Some say disease and health are all in our minds and and manifestations of us not living true to our values. Well, today you'll be treated to an insight and a perspective by a very amazing man. And just before we get into the interview, Dr. John D. Martini's work has had a profound impact on my work. And I have to say, uh, through applying the principles that he teaches in the Breakthrough Experience and his prophecy programs, I've literally been able to transform my life. And I can honestly say that six or seven years ago, I didn't think that I would be interviewing one of my greatest mentors on my own podcasting show where I've interviewed a heck of a lot of my greatest mentors. So um, it is with my absolute pleasure that I can bring you this interview. So we're going to cross, it's not a live interview, obviously, but we're going to cross that in a second. But um, yeah, really hope you guys enjoy the interview and leave your comments and you know do share this on Facebook as well. Speak to you guys on the other side. Good morning or afternoon or evening, Mark. <laughs> How are you doing, John? It's it's uh, nighttime actually. Ah, but you wouldn't well, know it. It's nice and sunny. It's it's morning here, evening there. So we got a, a global time frame here. That that's spot on. Um, yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. And before we get started, I just wanted to to kind of let the listeners know as well. You, your work has made an absolutely profound impact on my life, and I'm very grateful for you for the uh, the principles you've you've not only taught me, but also for coming on the show and getting to to share you and your wisdom and your knowledge with all the listeners today. So, really, a uh, big humble thank you because five years ago, I don't think I would have got there if I didn't learn the lessons that you've taught me. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, let, let's get into it. Um, I've heard you talk about the, the mind and body relationship before, and I believe in one of your programs, uh, Prophecy 2, as well as Breakthrough, you touch on it as well. You talk about the manifestations of mind and body. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about those, I guess, those programs? Yeah, well, the, the program that I call uh, the Breakthrough Experience, I do a brief mention of the relationship between mind and body, but in my... Uh, next level program, Prophecy 2, um, I definitely spend, I, I cover nearly a thousand different health conditions and the underlying psychology in them, the endocrinology, the physiology, neurology, um, every aspect of how those relate. And it's a very in-depth program. It's five days long. Um, we had that in South Africa with about 130 different health professionals at it. But we, we, uh, I'm very much interested. I've been involved in the mind-body connection now for nearly four decades. So I'm very fascinated by it, Very uh, with a new insight in the last 30 to 40 years of epigenetics and the relationship between our perceptions uh, and our environment uh, and onto our genetics and our physiology. Profound things are happening in that field now. So there's amazing insights that are being emerging. So you just you just touched on something very, and that's the I guess the theme of the whole call and the whole show tonight is is the mind and body relationship. But one thing you just touched on there was was epigenetics. So it, my understanding is that it really is uh, as simple as our thoughts impact our genes. Is that right? Well, what happens is uh, <clears throat> each individual has a set of values, a set of priorities that they live their life by. And whenever they perceive things, they filter things through those values. And whenever things support their values, um, they literally induce a series of polypeptides and amino acid-derived neurotransmitters, neuroregulators, and modulators, and hormones. And these affect cell walls uh, throughout the body, depending on how they're distributed. And those cell walls initiate a cascading of enzymes that literally what they call methylate or acetylate the genes and the histone proteins around the genes. 
and alter transcription and protein function. And literally, the cells find change. So our perceptions, based on our values and our beliefs, uh, have a vast impact on cellular function. And we now know that we can literally turn on and turn off various genes. And now we're getting it down to, like we first discovered the genome, now we're understanding the epigenome, how different emotions are actually impacting uh, precise genetics uh, down to different amino acid sequences that are being manufactured um, and literally regressing or progressing different enzymes that are being manufactured in structural proteins. So without question, our mind affects our body and our thinking and our feeling and our emotions have a huge impact, if not the most important impact, on health and disease. So without a doubt, that's uh, drastic. I started writing about this 35 years ago, and I've been writing since about it, and a um, very, very fascinating field that's emerging. Wow, cool. So before we get more into that, something that you taught me, and I definitely want to, I guess, teach the listeners this kind of perspective, um, there, are body, there are parts of our body that we both despise and love, and you know, something that I've come to learn and, and learn through your principles is that we never get rid of this. Uh, what, what's something that people can, I guess, do to overcome the fantasy of trying to be perfect all the time? Well, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, even supermodels, and I found this fascinating. <clears throat> I found that they, no matter how attractive they are to the general audience, um, they like and dislike their body. They always have something that they that uh, they don't like. I mean, I, I look at them and I go, oh, they look great, but they automatically think, well, their hair's too thin or they're their thighs are too long or the, you know, one thing or another, they always have something to pick on. And I found out that we have a, a thermostat, a homeostat inside our mind to both build and destroy us, to uh, kind of put ourselves up and put ourselves down. We've all had experiences where we feel proud and then we feel shame. We kind of build ourselves up, put ourselves down. But we do this not only mentally, but we also do this physically. So no matter what, these are uh, either very balanced and very, very mild, or they're very extreme. And if it's very extreme, we can get manic and depressed about our body and set up incredible fantasies and unrealistic expectations by comparison. Whenever we uh, see somebody that we think is more attractive than us, we can inject um, the, the values and the ideals of what they look like into our body and then judge ourselves accordingly. It is so important to understand that we need a homeostatic mechanism on our thinking about our body, and it has to have a balance, and don't have false expectations on one side. I believe that uh, there's a condition called dysmorphia, basically, that is the addiction to fantasies about bodies and the resentment to body parts because of this. And this can cause a lot of distraction to people and sometimes unwise, volatile behavior. And so it's wise. I have developed a methodology, of which I call the Demartini Method, which is a science of how to you might say homeostate and bring balance back to the mind so you can appreciate the body. Because the real truth is your body is designed to be both liked and disliked, you might say, it's mm. to, but not to the extremes. And so it's wise to have a balanced orientation. The quality of our life is based on the quality of the questions we ask. And in the method, I help people ask balancing questions so they can love and appreciate their body, not in fantasize and infatuate with it. So I guess to summarize as well is where you kind of see people who are almost have infatuated with, I guess, maybe their upper body and they might have a resentment for their lower body. You see that a lot, a lot as well. I know at least I see it a lot in the gym. Yeah, everybody has a part. I mean, I, I've never really worked with somebody in this field without finding these polarities. Uh, somebody will love their hair and they'll love their eyes, but they may not like their cheeks or they might like their breast and they may not like their butt. Or they might like their legs, but they may not like their, their upper arms. There's always something. So you have to ask the question, if you have a body part that you're not liking, you have to ask, how does it serve you? How does it help you fulfill your highest values? What's most meaningful to you? And actually find the benefits of that. And then the parts that you're all infatuated with and all proud of, you might even be wise to ask, how is it a disservice? And calm them both down. Because if you have an expectation on one, you sometimes create an unrealistic expectation on other parts. But I've never met anybody that doesn't have both sides. And um, so the perfection is not one-sidedness. The perfection is that balance. That's what the true perfection is. And if people understand that they already have that, uh, they'll appreciate their lives more and love themselves more. Absolutely. 
Um, there, there seems to be a lot more, I guess, sickness and disease today than there was 50 or even 60 years ago. What, what would you relate this to? I mean, are we shifting as a society towards one perspective? Well, I think that uh, there was probably, or there's, well, there's one factor that we're having greater details and diagnostics, so we're able to identify various conditions. Another one is the expansion of labels because of marketing in the pharmaceutical and the health industries, to which automatically puts labels and therefore conditions. And the other is that um, we have missing nutrients today. There's a, a lot of malnutrition. I mean, the, the foods that we get in the stores today don't have all the nutrients needed. So we are basically missing nutrients. Then we also have uh, toxic pollutants that are in the air more so than ever before. And um, obviously there's a stress level. The, the speed in which we function is excessive. And so all these factors lead to nosocomial and you might say, uh, you know, allopathic or iatrogenic conditions. And so, and, and obviously we've now, because of the superbugs that are now emerging because of the overuse of antibiotics, we're now having a surge in some of the bacterial diseases and infectious diseases. So there's that. And then there's the, the, the stress levels, unrealistic expectations, because now we can compare ourselves to so many other people that have what we think is more than us. Um, we can then put up unrealistic expectation, add to the stress levels and the demand levels. All those factors are variables that are there and plenty, probably more than what I just mentioned. Well, that's a, that's a really good answer, especially with, I guess, the, the stress levels is something that um, there is a lot more ways, especially with Facebook and Twitter. We definitely can compare ourselves to, to different people a lot faster than ever before. So, well, I, always say that, I always say that depression is a comparison of your current reality to an unrealistic expectation and uh, in comparison to other people. So wise things to do is to compare your life and your own actions and even your body parts to your dream, but not to other people. Because uh, you're designed magnificently for your own mission and identifying your own highest value, your own inspired mission, what you're dedicated to, the difference you want to make in the world, and compare your daily actions to that instead of other people you get farther. Definitely. So I guess in a way, do you think people can, I guess, think themselves I guess, thin or think themselves sick? Well, you know, it's interesting. My uh, wife uh, from a number of years ago before she passed away, she... Uh, she had wrote a book called Think Yourself Thin. And so I'm very familiar with that construct. And uh, without a doubt, people with their attitudes uh, are more likely to, if they're inspired by life, are more likely to moderate their diet and keep more stable in their weight. Uh, it's been found that when people are fulfilling their highest values, their most inspired objectives, their aspirations and their inspirations are congruent. Um, when they do... They're less vulnerable to volatility in diet, less vulnerable to immediate gratification uh, in addictive behaviors or you know, maybe overeating behaviors. So if a person fills their day with things that inspire them and have such a busy day where they don't even have time to eat, they, they eat to live instead of live to eat. And they're more likely to keep a moderate uh, eating pattern. Right, definitely. Um, you, you've spoken before about uh, people with diabetes and they have a bitterness and people with hypoglycemia have a sweetness. Can you explain uh, what, what you mean by this? Yeah, it's been my observation uh, clinically with people over the last few decades um, that when I worked with the people with the diabetes, very commonly they're not easy to tell what to do. You can't tell them what to do. They're, they're, they, they are more likely to make their own decisions. Uh, and they're more a little bit on the, uh, you know, might say self-righteous side. And uh, the uh, hypoglycemics, you can tell them almost anything, they'll do it. And they're more on the what I call the self-righteous side. They, the, the people that exaggerate themselves raise their blood sugar, and people that minimize themselves relative to other people and are more altruistic tend to lower their blood sugar. Uh, we've all had that. When we're, when we're a little assertive towards somebody, our blood sugar goes up to deal with it. It's sort of a fight-or-flight mechanism. So... People that have different perceptions and different personas uh, can fluctuate their blood sugar, but diabetics are very commonly this pattern. That's why it's very difficult to get them to uh, follow instructions on wise diets and wise actions to keep the volatility of their blood sugar normal and the glycemic index down too. And so, but people with hypoglycemic, like I said, you can tell them uh, what to do and they'll follow it to the letter. They'll measure what they eat. They'll do all kinds of things. So, so these are personalities that are absolutely correlated, and I've seen it over and over. And even dogs and cats. Dogs are more out, more likely to be hypoglycemic, and cats more diabetic right. because of the same personality. The same thing shows up in animals. Wow. 
And, and I guess things like uh, anorexia, which we kind of touched on before, and body dysmorphia, what, what have you found them to be emotionally linked to? Well, I can't say that I found an absolute pattern in um, anorexics. Uh, believe it or not, some treatments for anorexics is just make them eat. And once they get in the habit of eating, they get back in the pattern again. Uh, that has been uh, quite useful. And I've also seen that in some cases, now not all, but in some cases, there has been um, emotional um, perceptions of trauma. Uh, you know, either uh, there were sometimes sexual issues, um, incestual issues. Sometimes there's been rapes. Sometimes there's been um, forced control, and it's the only thing that they can control back by parents. There's many different factors there. I, I haven't seen an absolute pattern on it, and I've certainly worked with enough of them, but I haven't seen an absolute pattern. But there's probably about eight or nine patterns that I've seen, but those are some of them. But sometimes just getting them in the pattern of eating. Sometimes they basically have set unrealistic expectations of themselves, and there's no way of living up to them. And their image of themselves is compensating for a shame and guilt. But uh, other times, um, there is also genetic factors you have to, to factor in. But the pressure, if they, can, if they can prioritize their daily actions and find out what's really meaningful to them and delegate lower priority things and dissolve with the Demartini method a lot of the emotional baggage that may be held on with their family dynamics, uh, this can at least alleviate part of it. But sometimes we just need to get them in a controlled environment and get them to eat. Right. Yeah, for sure. So um, moving on to, I guess, another, another co very common disease that, um, you know, is probably number one. Um, you've spoken many times about cancer. Uh, what behavioral themes and emotional links have you found with uh, cancer patients? I know you've mentioned before about the black and white thinking. Well, I was the president of the Cancer Prevention Control Association in Houston, Texas, many years ago. And then, of course, when I was in practice, I saw plenty of cancer patients. And I still, to this day, work with a lot of cancer patients. And there is, without a question, a correlation between the mind-body in this case. Uh, and I've read literature after literature, both sides. Some deny it, some affirm it, but I'm certain of it. I've seen it too many times. There is definitely uh, a regression to a more primitive behavioral pattern. Uh, we call it uh, Metazoa 1 in biology, uh, in the embryological stage and also in the um, anthropological stage of humanity. If we regress ourselves back to metazoa one uh, biochemistry and physics uh, of the body, uh, we initiate these cancer cells, these trophoblastic cells in the body. And so extreme polarities of perception in a relative world initiate this. In other words, if you have a perception that, well, my father was always mean to me, he was never nice, and my mother was always kind and, and, but, and always giving, but my father always was restrained and hated me, and there's all these all or none, black and white, every and always and nevers and complete highly polarized uh, black and white thinking. This tends to make us uh, highly stressed, uh, unavailable to adapt to a changing environment. And we hold on to emotional uh, labels and baggage that's very deep, sometimes very, very early in our lives that are very, very deep. And these things can regress our physiology and our neurotransmitters. And I've, I've traced this down to the science of it literally regress it down to genetic and activating junk DNA and metazoa DNA inside us. And so this regresses us back and activates these cancer states and initiates a regression of stem back to stem cell function. And uh, they've mapped this out. It's quite extensive, uh, but it's a beautiful um, understanding of how the body and the mind work. So anything we can do to reduce the stress levels, dissolve the emotional labels that people get stuck in. That's why I put the Demartini method together uh, columns 12 and 5, just specifically to help dissolve labels and extremes of polarities and perceptions and add synchronicity to opposites in our perceptions to help resolve that. Because without a doubt, when people do, they give their immune system a rally. And if there's a way of getting their natural killer cells and their T cells back up, uh, this helps uh, increase it. Balanced mind helps heal the, the, the body and helps the cancer uh, have a chance to be healed. So with all that said, I guess one of the, I guess, common like, maybe challenges that sometimes presenting this kind of, uh, I guess, perspective on cancer people come up with is, do you think that's still true for children? Absolutely. See, there's a, in Scientific American, over the last few years, there's been an increasing number of articles demonstrating, and other science journals, Science, Nature, all of them, uh, pretty well established that the construct of an innocent child is time to throw away. Uh, I, I'm, I'm certain, 
and working with children and working with regressed children, and now especially with a particular savant that I've had the opportunity to work with, um, we have right from birth and prior to birth, cognition, awareness, amazing skills, and the idea of an innocent, you know, blank slate individual, as it once thought in the last century, uh, is, uh, is out now. It's not real. So we, we, we have to quit treating children as these innocent little people. Uh, they have incredible strategies. They know what they're doing. They're scientists. They're learning things. They have objectives. They know how to use cries to get what they want. They know how to manipulate parents. Uh, they're very uh, uh, research-oriented. They try to figure things out. They have a lot of knowledge, and but they sometimes are born, believe it or not, thinking they should be the opposite sex, thinking that they're the cause of all the turmoil in the family. They sometimes are born with incredible emotional straits uh, and challenges. And uh, when we regress people, the children back, we find this. And amazing things, they're, they're born with unbelievable stress patterns. And they can affect immune systems like adults. And we have to realize that they're not clean slates when they come in. They come in... We, we can see in the ultrasound of a baby when it's under a high stress situation, we can see them squirming around and reacting. And we now know in regression that they have memories of these things. And these have a shocking physiological impacts. They affect methylation and acetylation of cells. They regress cell functions. Um, we can create disease right while we're in the womb uh, by the time we come out. So the, the idea that they're innocent and blank slates, uh, it's time to throw that out because that's not that what the facts show today. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. I'll definitely um, have to do more research on that one. Um, it gives a lot of food for thought. Do you think people gain a benefit from being sick? Um, there is definitely, definitely secondary gains and ulterior unconscious motives in almost every illness I found. Um, in fact, when I ask people uh, a surprising question, a shocking question to them, uh, what's the benefit you're getting out of this illness? At first, they want to slap me, but once they start digging, they uncover amazing reasons and motives. Um, let me give you one example of a story. I had a lady that came into my office many years ago with diabetes. She was in a wheelchair. She had an African woman uh, wheeler around. She came in, and I uh, did my evaluation, examination, and I gave her a report of findings the following day, and I outlined a, a treatment protocol and program that I really, truly believe would help her and help her... Um, from like you know pro progressing, and it involved quite an extensive amount of work. Though I mean, there was nutritional involvement, psychological involvement, uh, adjustments from chiropractic perspective, uh, movements, um, change in diet, uh, change in attitude, lots of things. And when I presented it to her, she looked at me and she kind of looked down and she would not even face me. I said, "You seem not to be interested in this this uh, this positive opportunity here." And she said, well, Dr. Martini, I really didn't expect to have anybody say I could be helped. Everybody said I would just deteriorate, and, I, and I'm covered. In, and if you actually get me well, I, that means I'd have to go function again, and I would lose the most important person in my life, the woman that wheels me around. She's been with me for eight years now. And I said, well, so what you're saying is that you really have no interest in getting back on your, on your feet again. And she goes, well, not really. I just came here because I have to do that in order to get my, my, uh, my coverage and I said, oh, okay. So anyway, she wheeled herself. They wheeled her out of there. And I said, I said, well, that's a lesson. And I started asking questions to patients. What were the benefits out of it? And you'd be amazed. I mean, absolutely blown away by what people uncover. Sometimes I've seen people with health conditions in order to get families together. Sometimes they get off work. Uh, we see it in childhood. Young kids get sick when they don't want to have to deal and face with a bully in school or a test or, or challenges at school. But this goes on in our life. And, if, and every time if we support the little child when it comes and gets a boo-boo and bumps its little elbow and we, give a, you know, we buy it ice cream and we take care of it, we train it to get what it wants by using sickness. So there's definitely unconscious motives in some of these conditions. And they're surprisingly, unbelievably revealing when you ask these questions. Um, so without a doubt, there's fact. I, I always say that nobody will continue to do something without a, a, a benefit, without a drawback. They're always looking for a reward without a risk, and every action is that. And even though we have infectious disease, even our immune systems can respond to our stresses and our perceptions and our unconscious motives and value systems to create symptoms. We've all been probably had in a moment where we've been really, really angry or very upset and end up getting a sore throat and a sickness within 30 minutes to an hour, and we wondered, oh, is that a virus or is that because of our emotions? So unconscious motives definitely play a role in disease, no doubt about it. Wow. That's um, yeah, great answer. 
From one, one of the schools of thought um, in medicine at the moment, it's quite popular, is that all diseases are autoimmune diseases, basically. So I guess you working one-on-one with, with people, um, have you found any emotional links to autoimmune disorders? Well, it's interesting. When I first started getting involved in mind-body back in the early 70s, I, um, I found there was only a few mentions of autoimmunity. That was a very, very rare uh, mention. And um, now there are, we're finding out that autoimmunity is, is a huge factor. We're finding a relationship between um, absorption syndromes and autoimmunity uh, coming through the cell wall, leaky gut syndrome and its relationship. We're finding out they have microchimerisms um, where there's all of a sudden an exchange between the mother's cells during embryological development, fetal development, uh, going into the bloodstream of the child and back and forth. And whenever you resent the mother, you can then create an autoimmune reaction to the cells that you picked up from the mother inside you and create uh, things. We find out we have shame reactions and blame reactions. Just way back at the very earliest stage of, of um, you might say, uh, phylogeny, you, you have what they call self-other recognition systems in the immune system. And this goes back even to sponges. And all the way through the vertebrate uh, lineage, all the way to the humans, the, these immune responses are there. So anytime we perceive something within ourselves that we are ashamed about, that we want to get rid of, anything we see something from the outside that we want to blame, blame and shame reactions can create autoimmune reactions. We found out that people can have allergic reactions also and autoimmunity as a result of this by associating extreme pains and value-challenging situations to uh, foods or to people or to almost anything. And so we definitely have a reaction psychologically to these autoimmunities. Uh, we found that narcolepsy, which is now known to be autoimmune related <clears throat> to hypocretin in the brain. Uh, we now know that uh, when a person all of a sudden starts having to talk about something that's very discomforting and challenging their value systems, they'll go into a sleep pattern and fall out to avoid it. Uh, we found out that some of the collagen diseases uh, and, and uh, that are involved in this also is a, breaking things down. We really feel like we're beating ourselves up and we're literally unraveling the tropicology molecules and collagen diseases emotionally from this. So there's no doubt that our psychology is affecting these immune responses because I've had people, hundreds of people over the years who've had these conditions and they use the Demartini method on them, neutralize the emotional charges uh, that are secondary and primary and literally change those responses. And they've just, they don't have those conditions. And it's just amazing watching. All right. Yeah. So it can be, you're saying it can be a number of different emotional links depending on what the actually auto, but mainly it's, it's blame and shame, you're saying? Well, blame and shame, anytime you have an unrealistic expectation on yourself to live outside your values or to live in a one sided world, um, you can initiate it. And anytime you project your values onto others and expect them to live in your values, and not their values, uh, or expect them to be one-sided people, always happy, never sad, this kind of thing, uh, you set yourself up for what is called the blame-shame um, game. And in that process, you run your immune system down. You can literally run it down in very very quick responses and regress it. Every time you are very, very stressed, you regress your immune system down all the way to the macrophage level and primitive response levels. And um, you can. this is what they found is initiating cancer metastases, these high stress patterns because you regress the immune system down to the macrophage and cancer cells are linking onto macrophage and having a diastasis and traveling through the body that way. So we, we, without a doubt, there are emotions that are regressing physiology and causing these immune reactions and autoimmunity is part of that. And, and there's other factors that, you know, we like to think and we like to blame genes only, but with, the, with what we're learning on epigenetics today, genes are more passive than we once thought. They're, 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 we're definitely impacting the genes and activating junk DNA, which is used to be called junk DNA, which is nothing but regressed early primitive forms of DNA that we need when we're under stress. When we we're stressed, we regress back and use old DNA from earlier species. Uh, that's why disease is many times a regression from a common state, a healthy state. Right. So yeah. there's, there's a tremendous amount of research on this today. Before I know we're coming to an end of the interview, but before we wrap up, I definitely want to touch on this topic. Is it possible to have health without the existence of disease? Well, uh, if a person could stabilize their emotions and stay in a state of grace, gratitude and love, and be certain and present and inspired and stabilize that, 
um, then the construct of health and disease come to a normality. You have what is called anabolism and catabolism, a building and destroying system in your body, a sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic system that's bringing a, a build and destroy constantly or destroy and build. You have mitosis, which is building and duplication, and apoptosis, which is destruction. You have oxidation and reduction, which is destruction and building in the body. All the way down to the cell wall, everything is recycling and remodeling itself. You have piezoelectrical remodeling. You have osteoblastic and osteoclastic remodeling. Your whole body is rebuilding and destroying. Neuroplastically, in the brain, it's even doing this. So you have to have build and destroy, and build and destroy is another term for health and disease. So to live in a fantasy uh, that you're going to be, quote, building without destroying uh, is kind of an illusion. Uh, if we just did build without destroy, we'd look like Job in Star Wars. We have to have a remodeling mechanism, and therefore we have to have health and disease. Disease is a lever arm of health, actually, and we need to have both of them. And that sounds odd, but I think they're finding out now that some of the diseases we have in childhood are essential for us to have health in the future. So we have to have both. And, and to think we're going to have uh, one without the other, I think, is deluded. It's like trying to be only positive thinking and never have a negative thought. Mm. I always say that uh, the negative thoughts are essential in life, too, to help us set realistic expectations and not set fantasies for our life. So we need both in life. And right. real uh, wellness includes both health and disease. All right. Great answer. Um, and, and final thoughts? Well, I just say that um, I appreciate the questions. These are great questions. And um, I think that uh, if a person will identify what's truly most important in their life, if they go to my website and they go to uh, determine your values on the menu, drdmartini.com, and they go there and they can determine what their highest values are and set goals that are congruent and aligned with that, and they live more fully inspired and aspired that way, they have a decreasing probability of volatility in their body. And the more volatility, the shorter the lifespan. Uh, so moderation, rhythm, and consistently is a byproduct of an inspired being. So I would say find out what your highest values are. Set goals that are congruent with that. Delegate lower priority things. Do what's truly meaningful to you. Fill your day with inspired, meaningful actions, or otherwise it'll fill up with things that frustrate you. And then eat wisely. Drink plenty of water, not the other stuff. The rest of it's not necessary. Water's what's, what's wise to drink. And uh, breathe deeply, and you go back to the basics and go for a walk. And make love. You do those things, you're going to have a longer life and probably more productive life, more meaningful life, more inspired life, and you probably won't have time for the oscillations of health and disease. Wow. So where can people go to, to learn more about you? Well, they can go to, simply to my website, uh, drdmartini.com, D-R-D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. And on there is just a wealth of information, radio, television, newspaper, magazine articles, inspirational writings, or Facebook they can go to. Every day is an inspirational message there, Dr. Martini Facebook. But just there's just a wealth of information there that you could just Kate and just learn. Because I'm dedicated to expanding human awareness of potential and educating people across the world. So that's what the website will be filled with. Oh, thank you. I could speak to you all day, John. Thank you so much for, for coming on and, and teaching the wisdom that you've been teaching. And I really look forward to seeing you in seminar very soon. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Appreciate uh, giving me the opportunity to share a message. Thanks, John. Speak to you soon. Look forward to it. Bye. Bye. Wow, that was the interview with Dr. John Demartini. And um, make no exaggeration, guys, everything I said on the call about Dr. John, him having such a profound impact on my life is absolutely true. Um, I went to my first breakthrough experience, I think it was in maybe 2007 or 2006. I think it was 2007. And then from there, I guess, um, you know, my whole perception of, of, I guess, it might sound a bit corny, but my whole perception of reality really kind of changed a, a lot. So um, I would really recommend, you know, if you can make it, definitely get yourself down to a breakthrough experience with Dr. John Demartini. Um, he speaks you know, a number of times a year, so whether you're in Sydney, Melbourne, Queensland, really doesn't matter. He, he does them all over Australia. Um, I've also done the Prophecy Program as well with John. I did that, I think it was in 2009 or 2010, but um, yeah, either way, both amazing programs, and there really only is one John Demartini. 
and he absolutely, you know, you go into those seminars and he absolutely goes for it, you know, from 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., whatever it starts, to sometimes 10, 11 at night, um, pretty full on seminars, but you definitely, needless to say, you definitely get your money's worth. So, yeah, great experience, highly recommend it for everyone. Um, you know, grab his books. The, the Breakthrough Experience is a great book to, to read if you're new. Um, the Path of Love, I think, is another one by John that, that I have. I can't remember the exact title. I'll put it up on my, my website. Um, and the other one is if you're in business, how to make one hell of a profit and still get to heaven. I've got stacks of, um, I, know, I don't know if you can tell by now, but I'm a massive John D. Martini fan. And the fact that I just interviewed John D. Martini, uh, I'm still kind of coming to grips with because he's been a, a very big mentor for me for, for quite a number of years. So anyway, guys, I, I, I will stop ranting now. Um, I hope you guys really enjoy this interview. It's been a big one for me. Uh, leave your comments below, post it on Facebook, share it with your friends, do all that fun stuff. And uh, till I speak to you next time, guys, go to www.maximusmark.com forward slash radio, listen to more great podcasts just like this one. And remember to supplement smart, eat well, and train hard.